Welcome to Market Matters, our markets podcast on making sense, the hub for J.P. Morgan corporate and investment bank podcasts. In each episode of Market Matters, we discuss the latest news and trends shaping markets today. Hi, I'm Eloise Goulder, head of the Data Assets and Alpha Group here at JP Morgan. And today I'm absolutely delighted to be joined by Anthony Todd, who is co founder and CEO of Hedge Fund Aspect Capital, which is a global systematic investment manager. Anthony co founded Aspect Capital more than 25 years ago. It was back in 1997. So he has an incredible perspective on the evolution of the industry and the evolution of those systematic alpha strategies over that period of time. So I'm really looking forward to diving into all of this with him. In this episode, we'll hear from Anthony about the long history behind trend following strategies. If you look at systematic medium-term trend following, which is very much at the heart of the managed futures sector, a lot of people still call it the CTA, Commodity Trading Advisors Sector. That sector has its roots going right the way back to the late 1940s. The philosophy behind these strategies. The hypothesis which I think is strongest is the tendency for market behaviour to be driven by herd behaviour, by the herd behaviour of investors. And the pros and cons of trading liquid markets versus the more esoteric alternative markets. The whole idea that trends are exhibited across any market that you care care to trade. So why not actually then generate a programme which tries to maximise the number of potential sources of return? Those programmes, I think, have a very strong proposition, but the proposition is completely different. The aim of those alternative market programmes is more to generate steady absolute returns. So, Anthony, thank you so much for joining me here today. Eloise, it's a great pleasure to be here. Thank you. And it's worth noting that given we have a lot of material to cover, we will be splitting this conversation into two parts. So part one will really cover the past to the present. So Anthony's background and the evolution of the industry up until today. And then part two, really focusing on the future and discussing how all of these trends might evolve from here. Anthony, could you start by introducing yourself and your background in your own words? Yes. By way of background, I studied physics up at Oxford many years ago. The lucky coincidence there was I studied physics with Michael Adam and Marty Lewick, the A and the L of AHL, one of the world's leading systematic investment management companies. I went on to go into finance and straight away from physics. So joined a stockbroking firm called Phillips & Drew which was then in the mid-1980s taken over by UBS. Background there, so going right the way back in the of the early 1980s, period just coming out of a period of high inflation. So interest rates at that point were sitting at around 14% in the UK. And it was the start of a pretty much a 40-year bull market in fixed income markets. And stockbroking firms at that point had very much focused their attention on equity markets, not bonds. So they were very keen to find individuals with background in maths, in physics, in engineering to build out their bond market departments. So I worked in bond trading desk during the 1980s. Meanwhile, Mike Adam and Marty Lewick went off to work for Brockham Securities, building systematic trend-following models. At that stage, the efficient market hypothesis was the dominant market theory. So And the efficient markets hypothesis revolves around a concept that all market information is reflected in prices at any particular time. And therefore, it's absolutely impossible to add any alpha. So looking back at that time, it it seemed to me that Mike and Marty, there was no chance than building out a business around trying to actually apply a systematic investment management approach. But two things happened during the 1980s. The first is that Mike and Marty actually built a highly successful business with a remarkable track record. The second thing is that I could see from where I was sitting at Phillips and Drew, I was surrounded by a whole range of different traders. The most successful traders were those traders who had a completely disciplined rule-based approach. So to me, it was a conjunction of those two different outcomes that meant that when in 1992, I was offered the role to actually join Michael Marty at AHL. AHL was just very much taking off at that point, having become part of the man group. It was just too good an opportunity to turn down. So I started work there, as I said, in 1992, went on to found Aspect in 1997. Fantastic. It's helpful to hear you talking about the rules-based, process-based system that you saw your colleagues using there and the success of that strategy. And presumably, you wanted to take some of that 
to Aspect Capital when you founded it. I mean, can you talk about what your philosophy for Aspect Capital was? Yeah, I mean, the philosophy, it was interesting. If you look at systematic medium term trend following, which is very much at the heart of the managed futures sector, a lot of people can still call it the CTA, commodity trading advisor sector. That sector has its roots going right the way back to the late 1940s. The first CTA fund was actually set up by an individual called Richard Donchian in 1949. So it's probably the longest running alternative investment management strategy. But the sector really began to take off in the 1970s. So the 1970s, a period of obviously high interest rates, high inflation, collapsing the stock markets, two energy market crises, driving very strong trends, driving very strong momentum in markets. So that represented just a golden time for medium term trend following. But in terms of the investors in managed futures, it was very much the preserve of high net worth investors. Institutions just did not touch the sector for very good reasons. The sector typically had extremely high fees. It had limited liquidity. It had limited transparency. It had redemption penalties. Now, in the 1990s, just a small number of institutions began to become aware of the fact that underneath the covers, underneath this cloak of high fees and lack of transparency, there was a very valuable source of diversifying returns, a source of returns which is uncorrelated with stocks and uncorrelated with bonds. And in the mid-1990s, the few institutions and the few consultants were beginning to look at the sector more closely. And the whole philosophy behind Aspect was building a business that would meet the requirements of institutional investors. So it's a very different business model. To meet the requirements of institutional investors, first and foremost came performance. You know, our view was this is all about generating consistent, diversifying performance. It was not a distribution-led business. So in order to do that, the first thing we very much emphasised was the importance of building and investing in a very strong research capability. Second point was we could see that institutions were going to want total transparency on their positions. So we needed to build a scalable managed account platform with a focus on actually providing a high level of transparency and client service to our investors. That was the philosophy behind building the business in the first place. And alongside that came the importance of culture. We knew that to build the type of company, the type of team that we wanted, we needed to build a certain culture which would enable us to attract, motivate, retain the very brightest, the very smartest people we could find. Fantastic. Thank you for articulating all of those pillars, really, of Aspect Capital. It's also really helpful to hear you go through the history of these strategies all the way back to the 1940s. I haven't heard that <laughs> mentioned <laughs> that mentioned before. I typically hear that CTAs really started their heyday in the 70s and the 80s. So fascinating to hear that history. And actually, isn't it true that in academic research as well, momentum trend following factors do go back a very long time, hundreds of years, I think? which marks trend-following strategies apart from multiple other techniques where we don't have so much academic literature. I think that's absolutely right, Eloise. As I mentioned earlier, our perspective is that the managed futures sector is the longest running alternative investment management sector. We have a 25-year track record. We can actually point to some of our competitors who actually have track records running back right to the 1970s. So there have been a number of academic studies which have created synthetic futures markets. Yes. Obviously, 100 years ago, 200 years ago, the futures markets just didn't exist. And then backtest a rudimentary medium-term trend following models to see how they would have performed over the very long term. And time and time again, there have been numerous academic studies effectively repeating the same type of analysis and reaching exactly the same conclusion, that here is a very persistent effect, which has the strong benefit of providing returns which are completely uncorrelated with stock markets and completely uncorrelated with bond markets. Mm. Well, I really want to dive into that persistent effect and the source of the alpha strategy and why that exists in due course, because I think it's such a fundamental, important topic to cover. But just before we go there, you're obviously introducing your firm, Aspect Capital. Can you tell us about the name? The name, Eloise, so it's interesting, going right the way back, this is now 26 years ago. You know, Marty Eugene was the third co-founder and I agreed on pretty much everything. We agreed on exactly the type of business we wanted to build. We agreed on the culture. I talked about the culture of the firm a little bit earlier. One of the first things we did was write a culture document. We set down very clearly exactly the type of culture we want to build, culture revolving around a team-based approach, a collegiate approach, one focusing on mutual respect, integrity, transparency, partnership with our investors. So all of this we agreed on very quickly. The one element we could not agree on was the name of the company. And actually, if you walk around you know, the Aspect offices today, you'll find a number of meeting rooms 
which uses some of the discarded names from 26 years oh, ago. Oh, that's names, brilliant. Names what room is, are we in now? Actually, no, we're not. <laughs> <laughs> I wish we were in Wayland. So Wayland is is one example. Enigma is another example. These are names which we thought were actually quite interesting at the time, but then yes. we just couldn't coalesce around them. Yes. Aspect. The background there is that Eugene was a very keen, was, is a very keen glider pilot. Now, the aspect ratio of a wing is the square of the surface area of the wing over the wingspan. It's that ratio. And as soon as we actually came up with the name Aspect, Eugene immediately said, that's it. You know, I like that name. We didn't even know at the time exactly why he liked the name. Well, why was it? Because <laughs> it's a gliding term. Said, fine, Eugene. <laughs> In that case, we're Everyone's actually going to go, everybody's happy. What we were looking at was the whole concept that it was a new aspect of actually looking at finance. That's how Marty and I looked at it. Eugene looked at it as a gliding term, but that's how we actually reached an agreement. <laughs> I don't know if most people would know that uh, without the explanation. So that's fantastic. So can we just touch on why you believe Aspect has edge? Because my natural question really is, if these trend following strategies are so persistent, why doesn't everyone get in? And doesn't that alpha get crowded out? You've been going for so long, you clearly do have edge. What do you think is the driver behind that? I look at our edge as being a combination of a number of different factors. One, as I mentioned earlier, the strong investment we've made in research and development. We know we're, yeah. we're constantly looking at ways of trying to refine our models, improve our models, add to our models, develop other models. So we see that the market in which we're operating is highly competitive. The markets are constantly evolving and therefore to stay one step ahead of the market's competition, it requires that really sharp focus on research. That's one element. I think the second element is the level of experience that we're able to bring to the whole challenge of actually building systematic investment management models. As I mentioned, I've been working in the sector for 30 years. I'm fortunate enough to be working with Marty, who has experience going back 40 years. And that experience, I think, does actually count for a lot insofar as we've been through difficult market environments. We've been through environments where the strategies have performed well. We've been through periods, for instance, the period 2009 through 2019, which was actually a challenging period for medium term trend following. But our experience enabled us to retain a very consistent approach and avoid style drift. So I think that's the third area I'd point to, the third differentiator is the fact that although our models have actually developed significantly over the course of the last 25 years, we've retained a completely consistent approach and avoided that style drift. Your point about crowding, I think, is a really good point that, as I said, during those difficult periods between 2009 and 2019, a number of investors, a number of commentators said, ah, well, of course, the CTA space, the managed futures space, it's become too crowded, as, mm. as, as you were saying earlier. Too easy to do, too many new entrances it's become crowded. We'd look at that as being a hypothesis, and we looked at that hypothesis very closely. And first of all, we couldn't see any evidence that market behavior had actually changed. Second thing is actually looking back in the history of managed futures, going back 50 years or longer, one could actually see that there have been other periods of extended periods of challenging returns. So that again would tend to indicate that this time isn't different. But what we were also able to do is build a naive model of the entire managed futures sector. So mm. just take a, a fairly rudimentary trend following approach, apply it to the same set of markets that the majority of participants would be trading. And through that, actually estimate what's the potential consumption of open interests for the whole sector. We did that piece of research. One of the significant investment banks did that. One of our competitors did that all independently. I can hasten to add, we all reached the same conclusion that actually the sector was a long way away from hitting any capacity constraints. Thank you. That's extremely clear to me. And I can't even imagine how that period, 2009 to 2019, the whole decade where trend following strategies weren't performing so well, I can't imagine how much research you had to do to really reach the conclusion that the space wasn't that crowded and that these strategies would continue and that you weren't going to drift your style. And presumably, you also needed a lot of confidence in your research, confidence in your models to stick with it. Yes, you know, I think that is absolutely right. And I think it would have been very easy at that stage. For instance, there were a number of observers who took the view, well, markets actually have changed, that markets have become more responsive. Information mm -hmm. has actually been disseminated more quickly, and therefore the right thing to do is to speed up the models. 
Other observers actually took the view, no, there's more noise in the markets and the right thing to do is slow down the models. There are some other observers who took the view that, for instance, in certain sectors such as the currency sector, because of the convergence of interest rates and the zero interest rate environment, that currency markets were going to remain completely range-bound and trendless. Therefore, there's no point in actually trading them. Now, again, these are all hypotheses that we tested through that period. I think it was that whole extent of our experience, our rigorous approach, the experience of our research team that enabled us just to take a very steady course and avoid speeding up, slowing down, adjusting the weighting, our sector weights in any of our portfolios. But it was a testing time. And did it pay off this idea of not drifting from your style and sticking with potentially the older models? Generically, we hear that trend following models have performed very well in the COVID period, so in the period post-2020. So I imagine that's your observation as well. Yeah, it is. And just one point of clarification, as you say, did we stick with our old models? I want to draw a distinction between sticking with our own models and avoiding style drift, because our models evolve quite significantly over that 10-year period. But we avoided the pitfalls of taking the view that this time is different. The most dangerous words in finance, you know, this time is different. That's the trap we didn't fall into. And I think the benefits did come through, particularly during the course of 2022, for us and for the sector in general, that when there were those strong trends as a result of the um, strong inflationary environment we actually saw in 2022, so we saw collapsing bond markets, falling stock markets, rallying energy markets as a result of geopolitical considerations, and a strong dollar, we were able to capture those trends effectively and provide those diversifying returns that investors were looking for from this sector. Absolutely. And so going back to the philosophy of these trend-following strategies, you referred to the fact that they were deployed as early as 1940 and they really took off in the 70s and the 80s. And the academic literature supports this as well. What do you think is driving this consistent outperformance of momentum? There are a lot of hypotheses (laughs) about this. The hypothesis which I think is strongest is the tendency for market behavior to be driven by herd behavior, by the herd behavior of investors. And we see that in extremis with the manias and the crashes that we've actually seen over the course of the last 20 or 30 years. You think about the internet boom in the late 1990s, pretty much when we were setting up Aspect. Nobody was interested in diversifying strategies because stock markets, particularly the NASDAQ, particularly technology stocks, it was just absolute boom time. So that to me was her behavior operating in one direction. Then, of course, the technology bubble burst in 2000 and we saw the S&P 500 more than halve between 2000 and its nadir in 2003. So you saw a crash over that period. We saw a similar scale of crash for very different causes actually during the course of 2008, during the global financial crisis. And then I would say a crash of a smaller order of magnitude. But what was unusual, of course, last year was it was actually spread over stock markets and bond markets. Now, those are extreme examples of herd behavior, investors operating to come together in Mm. crowd, actually come driving momentum. I think the three observations to make about that is, first of all, that herd behavior is exhibited over multiple timeframes. You'll have some investors who are very responsive and just driving short-term trends. You have other investors, they could be large pension funds, could be large central banks, who will actually be operating, will be taking a a longer term approach and actually driving trends over, say, a number of months or sometimes actually over years. Another further kind of aspect is that these trends operate over any market in which you come to care to consider. And again, on the basis that our hypothesis is it's very much herds that actually drive that momentum, that drive that serial autocorrelation of returns. Therefore, you'd expect that momentum behavior, that trend following behavior to be exhibited in markets as diverse as fixed income markets, currency markets, stock markets, or energy markets, or agricultural markets. That her behavior is exhibited across a broad spread of markets. The final point about trend following, it's a small effect. So I was mentioning how in the 1980s, the dominant market hypothesis was the efficient market hypothesis. That, I think, has now been very much discounted. But I think one can actually say that markets are pretty efficient to a certain extent. And I think the point about trend following, it's a tiny effect, tiny statistical effect, Mm. but then multiplied over multiple timeframes and over multiple markets, it is possible to build a program which has those properties of providing strong positive returns over the long term, and in particular could provide strongly diversifying returns during times of market crisis. So over the course of the last few years, a number of consultants have coined the term risk mitigating strategies or crisis risk offset and have recommended their pension fund investors to allocate part of their portfolios to a collection of risk mitigating strategies 
And central in those risk mitigating strategies is an allocation to medium term trend following auto managed futures. So managed futures time and again in times of market crisis. So whether we look at the technology bubble bursting in the early 2000s, we look at the GFC, we look at the inflation and geopolitical crisis during the course of 2022, managed futures trend following has been able to provide strong positive returns in strongly declining persistent erosions of principle in stock markets and bond markets. Yes, thank you. Just going back to the original question and this herd mentality and herd behaviour, it's so fascinating that even if it's a tiny effect, as you say, it is so persistent through time and across markets. It fascinates me that there is an alpha here because the herd is sometimes wrong. You know, the herd can, might follow a trend too far and then witness a drawdown, for yep, example. That's absolutely true. So you're making alpha by being with the trend, but on the other hand, presumably you have stop loss mechanisms or mechanisms in place yep. in your programs to prevent the downsides of following the herd. So how do you think about that? Yeah, actually got three answers to that. The first is that as a trend becomes overextended, and then what we refer to as our position functions, the structure in such a way that will actually fade the trend. We'll never take a position against the trend, but we'll mm -hmm. actually begin to scale back our position in the event that a trend has statistically gone too far. Yes. The second element is when we see a market effectively go into a blow-off phase, so suddenly you actually just get you know, a market almost running, as you would say, too far, then what happens is the volatility, the risk of that market actually increases. Yes. Now, though we're trying to identify trends over a period of, say, two to three months or longer, that's in aggregate the responsiveness of our models, from a risk management perspective, we're highly sensitive to risk. And so as the, the risk of a market actually increases, we are, again, systematically in a completely automated fashion, scaling each position across every market we're trading inversely proportional to the volatility of that market. Yes, position. makes sense. Now, in terms of stop loss, again, I think it's one of the other strong characteristics of a trend following approach is almost inherently stop loss in itself. And as far as if the trend actually turns around, then our trend following positions will naturally follow the trend and begin to actually close off the position. I mentioned a little bit earlier that we're actually aiming to capture trends over a period of two to three months or longer. But we do that through the combination of eight separate price filters. They're filters to try to identify whether a market is in an uptrend or a downtrend over multiple time horizons. So our fastest trend following approach will be looking for trends yes. over a period of about one week or longer. Our slowest moving filters will be looking for trends over a period of around six months or longer. So the weighted sum yes. of those the positions from those eight different filters results in an aggregate responsiveness of around two to three months. That's the sweet spot in terms of the trends we're actually looking for. So again, the reason for laboring that point is that when a market turns around, those fastest models are the models which are quickest to respond. Yes. And so you can almost look at our fastest models as having a stop loss type of characteristic. We have over the years researched many times the concept of having fixed stop losses. We found those to be ineffective and actually, therefore, we rely on the implicit stop loss nature of those trend following models. Yes, thank you. That's extremely clear. And it's wonderful to think that when you're running your strategy across multiple asset classes and multiple regions, you're really riding the waves or following the trends in multiple different directions. But as they get extended, you have these natural processes to move to the next trend. Yes, that's exactly it. Brilliant. And on the topic of different asset classes, what are you involved in and what are your observations on the pros and cons of diversifying across different, yeah. both traditional, highly liquid and more alternative markets? It's a really interesting area, Eloise. So if you look at the, say, the Aspect Diversified program, which has a track record going back almost exactly 25 years, that trades around 180 different markets. The majority of our investors have daily liquidity. And therefore, we focus on trading the most liquid markets. Those 180 markets are spread across eight different sectors. So sectors that we trade um, include stock indices, credit, short-term rates, long-term bonds, currencies, energies, metals, agriculturals. The main aim of that program is to actually provide returns uncorrelated with stocks, uncorrelated with bonds over the long term, clearly aiming to actually provide strong positive returns but particularly during times of persistent erosion of principle in stock markets or bond markets. And that's why that program, the focus is on the dominant, the largest liquid market. So in an event such as last year, as I mentioned earlier, we had that very persistent inflation geopolitical crisis as well in the Ukraine. 
driving down stock markets, driving down bond markets, driving up the dollar. It's those large liquid markets where you're seeing that herd behavior. Yes. Um, and that as a result, we and other participants in our sector were able to generate those strong positive returns. Now, interesting point about diversification, because there's an, in some respects, a totally different type of program that we and some of our competitors have launched over the course of the last few years, which uh, focus on alternative markets, not necessarily illiquid markets, just harder to access markets. So looking to access a broader range of, say, agricultural markets in the energy sector, looking at markets or trading markets such as power, emissions, butane, propane, just a wake a broader set of markets in interest rate swaps, you know, trading more emerging markets, in currency trading non-deliverable forwards. So the concept there is, as I mentioned earlier, the whole idea that trends are exhibited across any market that you care, care to trade. So why not actually then generate a program which tries to maximize the number of potential sources of return? Those programs, I think, have a very strong proposition, but the proposition is completely different from the first program I was actually referring yes. to. The aim of those alternative market programs is more to generate steady absolute returns. So by maximizing the diversification across a very broad set of markets, the utility function there is to try to provide positive returns across a wide range of different market environments. But a portfolio such as that, it will have some of those crisis alpha properties that I mentioned earlier, but not to the same extent, because in a time of market crisis, you're not going to see that herd behavior operating in some of those more esoteric agricultural markets, energy markets, or interest rate markets. Yes, that's very clear. Two different utility functions. The liquid market's much more of a diversifying function, because those are the areas, of course, that are going to be fastest to move, where you're going to have most players going in and out. And then the alternative markets providing that absolute returns utility function, less crowded space, presumably, but less responsive to crises. Correct. Uh, That's exactly because they're, they're less liquid. That's very clear. And it is worth noting that we spoke with David Dennison, who's deputy CIO at Flooring Court, which is another systematic hedge fund which focuses on alternative markets, and that your views, I think, on these utility functions are very much aligned with his comments. I think it very much comes down to this concept of, we hear some competitors, some observers just talk about the concept of trend everywhere, that trends do operate, that crowd behavior is driving trends across any market you look at. So why not diversify as broadly as possible? And exactly. So yes, I think as I said, it, I think it's a very strong proposition, but it has a very different utility function from a program actually focused on the world's most liquid markets. Those yes. are the markets that are going to trend the most during times of market crisis. And presumably there's also merit in putting those two together. Yes, there is. Absolutely. Yeah. Very, that's a yeah. really good point there, Louise. You know, what we've seen over the course of the last 10 years is our ability to be able to customize solutions to meet specific investor requirements. And so, yes, we have some investors who have combined our core trend following approach with our alternative markets yes. program. So, yes, combining different systematic approaches in order to meet different client requirements, that's been a strong area of focus for us over the course of the last few years. Makes sense. Thank you. Well, I think this is a great stage to wrap up part one of our conversation. And Anthony, I really look forward to continuing our discussion in part two. Thank you to our listeners for tuning in to this bi-weekly podcast from our group. If you'd like to learn more about Aspect Capital, then please do take a look at their website, which will be in the show notes. Otherwise, if you have feedback or questions, then please do go to our website at jpmorgan.com forward slash market dash data dash intelligence. And there you can send us a message via the contact us form. And with that, we'll close. Thank you. Thanks for listening to Market Matters. If you've enjoyed this conversation, we hope you'll review, rate and subscribe to JP Morgan's Making Sense to stay on top of the latest industry news and trends. Available on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, Google Podcasts, and YouTube. The views expressed in this podcast may not necessarily reflect the views of J.P. Morgan Chase & Co. and its affiliates, together J.P. Morgan. They are not the product of J.P. Morgan's research department and do not constitute a recommendation, advice, or an offer or a solicitation to buy or sell any security or financial instrument. This podcast is intended for institutional and professional investors only and is not intended for retail investor use. It is provided for information purposes only. Referenced products and services in this podcast may not be suitable for you and may not be available in all jurisdictions. 
JP Morgan may make markets and trade as principal in securities and other asset classes and financial products that may have been discussed. For additional disclaimers and regulatory disclosures, please visit www.jpmorgan.com forward slash disclosures forward slash sales and trading disclaimer. For the avoidance of doubt, opinions expressed by any external speakers are the personal views of those speakers and do not represent the views of JP Morgan.